Medicine of Vienna, um, of which he's the director, and at the Department of Behavioral and Cognitive Biology at the University of Vienna. He studies the physiological mechanisms that underlie complex and elaborate behaviors uh, with a focus on avian migration, as well as courtship um, uh, display, and hopefully we'll hear some of that today. Um, for his innovative approach that bridges animal uh, physiology and evolutionary biology, he received the Frank A. Beach Award from the Society of Behavioral Endocrinology in 2007. Uh, he is a fellow of the International Ornithologists Union, and since 2017, he's been conducting studies on the elaborate courtship displays of our rifle birds and our bow birds as well. Um, but don't let this fool you. He also has been talking about other species like uh, ring doves, those are not them. Um, uh, also interesting little mannequins, which I believe might be in today's talk as well, quails and even humans. And if you're interested, you should check out his Google Scholar profile for some of those, which I found absolutely fascinating. Um, so today he's going to be focusing on the quest uh, for the aesthetic value of courtship, courtship displays. So please uh, join me today in welcoming Dr. Uh, Professor Pisani. Thank you. So, so welcome. I think I understand. I understand that you hear me without a microphone, or should should I take a better microphone? Or oh, is it? Well, it was there before. I saw that. So maybe doesn't matter. You hear me, right? Yes. Right. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, because uh, there was a, there was a like a, a ice cream microphone uh, over there before any kind of. But um, I can also speak loud if you hear me. Okay, good. So first of all, I, thanks, thanks for coming. Thanks to everybody uh, who's following us from home or from their office. Uh, and um, I like to start my talk with um, uh, with a picture of uh, the, my lab, the, the, my team. Uh, many people doing different things. As uh, Tasmin said, we are doing research ranging from physiology of migratory uh, birds to uh, elaborate courtship, and which is the subject of uh, my presentation today. And um, yeah, I'm, I have a double appointment. I have to say that all the time because both universities are very jealous if I don't mention the other one. So, uh, and so I have to specify that this is, these are two different universities. And um, the talk today, I gave this title, The Quest for the Aesthetic Value of Courtship Displays. I look also using this nice map that uh, like make us think to and explore. This is kind of automatically going on. Uh, maybe this is not what I wanted to have. Sorry, give me a second. Maybe I have the the things, uh, the slideshow yeah, automatically said that, which I didn't have want to have. Thank you. Okay. So um, everything, of course, in biology nowadays, um, starts here with Charles Darwin. And you, you, you know, of course, that he developed his theory of uh, evolution by natural selection, but uh, he couldn't really explain everything with his work. In fact, he had like some nightmares. And this uh, is a good example of his nightmares. He, he, he actually literally wrote in his notes that he had a nightmare every time he thought about the peak of tail because of course, it doesn't make any sense from the perspective of natural selection. You know, uh, something like that doesn't help animals to survive. So why uh, would the bird have, have a tail so big and so long? Uh, but he was a clever man, of course, so it didn't take him a long time to develop an additional theory uh, to explain this. And this is the theory that he called actually the selection in relation to sex, what is nowadays we call uh, uh, the theory of sexual selection. Very interestingly, the theory was developed mostly to explain the origin of humans, so human evolution. So the theory is basically, um, uh, is, is relatively simple to uh, explain, uh, is um, if a trait confers to the bearer like a higher reproductive success uh, and the costs uh, in terms of survivor are lower, then the uh, benefits, then the states will evolve. And the first actual demonstration, uh, the first empirical test of the theory was actually given by Malte Anderson in the um, early 90s, where he actually used this uh, beautiful 
African uh, bird. Um, so this is a male uh, with a bird. I was told I have to use the pointer here. Uh, and yes, see here. So the tail is uh, kind of like uh, very long. And um, uh, he basically took uh, four groups of males uh, you see on the top uh, uh, graph. And they had more or less all the same tail length. And then you look at how many nests this male had because they are polyg polygynous. So each male had different nests with different females. Then he could, took like a scissor and glue, literally, and he cut the tail, which is dead tissue, uh, from some birds and he glued to uh, other birds. So these are the one on the right in the bottom graph with a very long tail. And then the shortened one were on the bottom left and then two control groups, one unmanipulated group and another group uh, had like the tails uh, cut and glued back in, in the same position. As you can see there, the birds with the elongated tail had many more nests, gained more nests, whereas the one with shortened the tail lost nests. So the reproductive success depended really on the length of the tail. Um, so this was the first like uh, empirical evidence that uh, uh, some traits can actually confer a, a reproductive advantages to the vera and confirm basically the idea of that. And in his book, in his really uh, like important book, where um, he summarized everything that had been done in this area of research until 1992, Anderson wrote that Darwin seemed to assume similar sense of beauty in other higher vertebrates as in men. But this assumption, right or wrong, is not necessary for female choice. Discrimination among males in relation to size, shape, color, or others should suffice. So basically, the possession of aesthetic sense by animals was one of the most debated aspects of the Darwinian theory, and it is, it is still nowadays. A, a very influential review published like uh, about a decade ago even went further, saying the flavor of, of Darwin's argument for female choice may represent one of the largest shortcomings of his treatment of sexual selection because it gave the impression of, that animals would need a human-like sense of aesthetics for sexual selection to operate. So basically, this idea that animals must have an aesthetic sense was a basically uh, an hindrance to development of the field. Some people were agreeing with that, many were not. In fact, especially people who had been working for a long time with uh, animals like birds of paradise, animals that have very elaborate courtship displays where you have a combination of behavior, calls, colors, modified, uh, feathers, modified bones, uh, or like uh, incredible um, uh, architecture, like in the case of the Fogelkopf bowerbird uh, here, uh, you know, what would you measure there to confirm if the male is better than another one? The number of colored uh, decorations, uh, which one? The disposition, the, the structure of the bower, the color of the birds, the movement, you cannot reduce everything to a single trait. And this difficulty is still there nowadays. And again, other cases where actually in the audience, one of the experts of the bowel words, Professor Endler, uh, he's been work, mostly work, uh, working with the great bowel birds. We, we have been uh, started a few years ago with spotted bowel birds. Again, in this case, uh, you see that the, this, uh, this, the males uh, build these uh, bowers, they put decoration in front, different colors, they present funny objects like this uh, uh, like uh, red plastic object to, to the females inside the bower. It, it is not just the size, it does not. It is not just a dimension or a color. It's a combination of many different traits. So I was very much like puzzled by that. I really thought, well, there must be something else behind. It can, we cannot reduce everything to a, to a single measurement or a few measurements. So with this idea in mind, uh, about 20 years ago, I started like working on this subject and I, I joined um, the uh, lab of Barney Schlinger at UCLA. Uh, Barney had started like a, uh, some serious work on this uh, beautiful little uh, neotropical uh, subosine called uh, Golden Color Manicus. And they have a beautiful display. They, uh, they basically display between these uh, saplings, you see here, like jumping from one sapling to the other one. They have a modified uh, feathers under the throat, so they have a kind of flag 
when they when they dance, and also they produce a loud snap with their wings. And uh, the females have a, a kind of very inconspicuous uh, dull plumage, as you can see here. This is the breeding male, and the male have also uh, brilliant colors. And the species is found between, uh, let's say, uh, um, Costa Rica and, and Colombia. So more or less corresponds to, to the Republic of Panama. So th there's nothing better than showing it uh, to you. The display is something I recorded a couple of years ago. Our team is joining. So as you, as you, I don't know if you noticed that, but the, so the male is jumping between sapling, uh, saplings and is produce, producing these loud snaps with their wings by uh, clapping the wings on the back. Uh, the, the female follows him by flying. So of course it's much less challenging. The, the, the male is only using uh, leg power to do the jump. So they are kind of a little bodybuilder, have enormous leg muscles and enormous wing muscles because of this uh, exercise. And, and the male basically spends the entire, a good part of the day in this little court. They clean, there is no litter, they remove leaves, they maintain the courts very nicely and spend most of the day there. So again, some people had done some uh, work uh, and they uh, actually found out some very interesting uh, aspects. Uh, so for example, copulations occur in the court. So it's very easy, relatively easy to measure uh, courtship success, reproductive success, because the, you know, the, the, when the female accepts the invitation by the male, uh, they, they will copulate in the court, so we can observe that. And because it is a lacking uh, species, uh, the females uh, then will leave and build the nest and um, um, basically raise their youngs on their own. The males do not contribute at all to the uh, next generation, they only provide the sperm basically to the to the offspring, but there is no other uh, contribution. So it's a, a very selective system where basically the choice and the preference is completely based on the courtship display. The females cannot use territory size or any nuptial gift or anything else. They only can select the male based on how good dancer he is. And surprisingly enough, or let's say not so surprisingly, uh, most of the study have been based on traits that could be measured, like plumage brilliance, the centrality of the court in the leg, how clean the court was, and the activity, the, like say, gross activity in the court. But there was basically no information about courtship performance or courtship choreography. So it is kind of surprising. The most amazing aspect of the courtship is actually the dance, but we didn't know anything about the importance of the dance for uh, success. Why? Well, probably because it was very difficult to measure. Uh, you cannot really do any proper measurement of this behavior using normal video cameras because the, the, the birds move very fast. So it's hard really to, to measure something. So I was lucky because at the moment I joined the lab, uh, a couple of years afterwards, the first portable high-speed camera was produced by a Californian company. This was called the uh, motion meter from Red Lake. And that was the first thing that one could take to the field had a huge battery pack, but, but that was not a problem. And we could actually take this into the field and measure uh, the, uh, the actually film the animals at high speed. So being able to then to see exactly what they were doing. So this is what they did. Um, uh, the, uh, my wife and the, my wife and colleague Virginie is on the, on the left of the screen over there. So we went uh, again to Panama and we set the, the camera and we attempted to do recordings of the, of the mannequins using the system. Um, it was challenging because we had only a very limited time. We had to switch on the camera. We had 16 seconds uh, to record it, had to download it back to uh, another recorder. It was nothing compared to what we have nowadays, but it was a good beginning. And uh, we did the first uh, study uh, which turned out to be very informative. And we basically found that females choose males 
based on the motor skills. So as you can see here, this is one of the examples. One of the things that birds uh, do uh, at the end of each jump is to restore pretty quickly their statuesque posture. So they jump, they land, and then go like that. And the duration of the movements, the time that they need to restore the statuesque posture was strongly correlated with courtship success. So like females really like males, they have good neuromuscular skills that they can coordinate very well during the dances. And we have, uh, of course, other variables showing that. Also in the same study, uh, by applying um, miniature uh, transmitters on the back of the birds, we could also measure the heart rate and correlate the heart rate then to metabolic consumption. So we could also show that the courtship is very costly. So if you look at the, here, so these are like, a, like normal activity, jumping chipu, which is a vocalization, the day baseline, and the heart rate will be about 500 uh, beats per minute. But when they display, like jump, nap, snap, display, roll snaps, and display flight, they go up to a thousand more. Actually, this is the highest recorded heartbeat ever recorded in a vertebrate. So these are impressive animals, impressive birds. And one will be tempted to say, okay, females select the males like, or evaluate the males like we evaluate a, a gymnastic uh, competition. So we, we score how good uh, the, 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 the gymnast uh, can jump and make uh, routines and land on the ground, like, you know, like, but landing is important, like, like restoring the statue posture and so on. But we thought, okay, well, this is for sure a very good indication, but there is something more. For example, in a, a series of other studies, we found out that the females lead the dances. In fact, by analyzing the, the, the videos, uh, slow motion, we saw that the, uh, the, 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 the male is sitting on the perch, the female is sitting there, and then the female will actually fly toward the, the, the male. And then at this point, the male jumps and produces the wing stuff. But it's always the female to initiate the, the jump. So as you can see in this graph here, you see the red arrows are the female jumps. So uh, jump and land, and male jump, jump and land. And you see that is always the female the red arrow preceding the movement of the blue arrow, pretty clear. So we thought, okay, well, first of all, it's not just like neuromuscular skills, it's also being able to keep pace, to keep the pace of the male. And also more recently, we were interested in the choreography. So I had a like, nice team, uh, uh, members of my team. So I, Judith um, did a PhD, Cleona is a postdoc who took care of all the uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence aspects, and Elisa was a brilliant um, a field assistant who then did another PhD in our, in our lab. So uh, I, this is actually a small insert because the uh, system for high-speed recording uh, broke down and had to send everything back to Vienna to be repaired. They did another small experiment in between. They were very kind of uh, creative and they did this. They uh, basically took um, the court, this is the court of the bird, and uh, before they did about 60 days of observation, this happened before they knew that they had a like, technical failure. But then when there was a technical failure, they did a clever thing. So they, they took a piece of bark, and the, the bark is like a like natural element in the rainforest. So there are always pieces of bark falling. Uh, you know, on the court, but they put it there on the sapling. And this is a very important sapling, this one here, because it's the one that the, uh, uh, the female use uh, to copulate. So the male invites the uh, females to sit on this sapling, to perch on this sapling. And then, so basically we tested what happened when the uh, sapling was obstructed. And then after four days, the bark was removed and we saw uh, what happened when the conditions were restored. Do you actually see my pointer when I move it? Because I don't see it. Okay, so there is no pointer. Well, I mean, you see the bark, I guess, it's a big red arrow, so I think you could follow my explanation. So this is what happened. During the, 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 the pretest on the left is the condition before the experiment was, uh, was made. And you can see the G, uh, in the ellipse, in the uh, red ellipse, 
the G on the bottom is brown. So you see that every time that the male invites the female to copulate, he will jump to the ground and back to suckling number one. When number one was obstructed, was covered by the piece of bark in the test phase, the male had to switch because to execute his invitation, need, he needed to move to a different sapling. And then when we removed the bark, he stayed there. So this is very fast explained, but what this means, this is a very good indication for motor learning, for a procedural learning. It's like when we go to the parking lot and we always do the same way to the office. If there are constructions, then we have to do to bypass. Uh, and we use another way. Now, if the other way is, is as long as the first one, we might keep using the second one because we get used to the other one. We don't even think. But well, this is called procedural memory. But this is a very good example that there was some uh, learning in the way uh, the, the birds perform their, their coach. So we thought that maybe males are building the choreography and they follow a scheme uh, and they learn to perform the choreography and the perfection of the choreography. After the study we did like uh, with the um, uh, high-speed camera in, 20, uh, in 2007, we could demonstrate and publish in 2011 the courtship activity and courtship performance are associated with mating success, but still we didn't know the importance of choreography. To, to do that, we attempted a very challenging uh, uh, entreprise, which is to uh, record the behavior of the animals in 3D. So you've seen for sure all these uh, methods to do uh, motion capture. Normally people have uh, um, little tags on the body reflecting the, and they, they put them on the joints and then you can basically uh, follow their movements and uh, many cameras are used so you can actually reconstruct the motion. These are used in the film industry, for example, to make uh, animals uh, moving like real animals. When we started the study, there was nothing available to be taken to the field. So together with a, 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 like a startup uh, in Vienna, LookBio, we developed a portable uh, system to uh, record the animals in the field and to, to do the the 3D recording, which is much more difficult than one thing. Normally, you think that you have different cameras, then you combine all the videos. Well, this is not the case. You have first to calibrate all the camera because the lens distorts the, 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 the division. Then you have to calibrate the, the space in which the recording is made. And of course, we could not use markers. So we had to do markerless um, motion capture. But, uh, Judith, in the picture, um, spent a lot of time, not only in the field, but also doing manual annotation to train the computer afterwards. And uh, uh, she basically had to do 50,000 uh, frames annotated by hand to be able to train enough the computer. So at the end, what we had, basically, we had, as you can see, the 3G, the cameras, uh, which were uh, able to uh, film the behavior from three different perspectives, and each dot will be uh, the position of the animal in space uh, during the jumps. And uh, in the next slide, uh, actually video, I can show you, uh, the, this are the, is the video, and uh, you can see the three cameras are synchronized, which is a very important aspect also of the whole job. You have to have the cameras perfectly synchronized, so you need a, a small uh, computing element in between to keep the camera synchronized. So you can see the perspective. This is the same animal filmed from three cameras. And this is what, what we got after training properly the, the computer. So nowadays there are other systems out in like uh, uh, that you can find doing similar things. They're not as good as our system, but Four years ago, this was really revolutionary because we could track in a very complex background. This is not a, this is not a, like a white mouse moving against a black background. These are animals that differ very little from the background, moving in a very uh, heterogeneous background. And you can see the system is uh, really good in tracking the movement of the birds. So thanks to that, we could actually reconstruct the choreography, the movement uh, of the birds in the court. And, and basically end up by having a like complete reconstruction 
of the of the dances uh, in in 3D. In 3D. And um, we found out we discovered many new things. Uh, for example, we found out that the jumps are perfect ballistic trajectories. There is no other force than the leg push at the beginning. There is no addition of other force components coming from the wings or other limbs. Uh, we also found out that basically we could measure the takeoff angle, the takeoff height, the velocity, the speed, acceleration. And for example, one of the nice discoveries was that these birds are really incredibly powerful. So the leaping force, which is the force with which they jump, it's about uh, the double of the highest recorded uh, uh, bird. So the, as you can see in this graph, the mannequins are about twice as much uh, as zebra finches, which are pretty good as well, and much better than pigeons or doves or starlings and others. So 9.6 times body weight. This is a standard way to measure leaping force. So we found a lot of interesting uh, things about mannequins. So now we end up by having something like that. We have uh, all the different traits. We know they are important for, uh, for male performance are important for female choice. Uh, the color, the plumage color, the position in the leg, if they're central in the leg, they are um, preferred. The morphology, they have modified bones actually to produce the wing snaps and they have modified feathers. The motor skills are important. Uh, choreography is, uh, is a, a, like a key element. <laughs> and also cardiovascular function condition. This is, I, I didn't show those data, but many different things. And what I really like now to, to find or to be able to describe is an integrated holistic value. So how can we put everything together? Do female mannequins evaluate a male by going trait by trait and saying, okay, he's a good jumper, but his colors are not very good. And the score is, could be a little bit better. Or actually they look at, at, at the whole, like we do. When we look at the dance show, if we are expert and if we are maybe in the, in the, in the business, we might spend time in analyzing the details of the dancer. But normally, first of all, we enjoy the show. We say, oh, it was a good show. It was a good dancer. Music was good. Clothes were good. Movements were good. Everything was good. So we appreciate the whole, right? This is the, the most important thing to say, oh, it was a good show. So I think that what we are looking at in mannequins, what we would like to be able to somehow to, to, to describe and, to, and to, uh, to have, to capture, is the aesthetic value of the, of the whole. So I just replaced integrated value with aesthetic value. And I think we are absolutely allowed to do that. So um, in, his, in, in the, in the uh, um, review, uh, uh, and, uh, Jones and Rateman said something, but I think that they, they, their mistake there is to say that uh, the, the treatment of sexual selection, it gave the impression that animals would need a human-like sense of aesthetic. They don't need a human-like sense of aesthetic. They need a bird-like sense of aesthetic. Right, so we don't have to assume that this is the same. That this is the same sense of aesthetic. Now, this is a very difficult um, topic, and I've tried uh, now. I've, I started about like eight years ago to uh, to 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 find uh, other people interested in in working on this topic. So I, we started like with a with a workshop that I uh, organized uh, together with. Um, um, a colleague who is a very known neuroesthetician. These are the people who look how our brain responds to arts and to, uh, like, say, to uh, pictures or, or sculpture and so on. So, so together with him, we organized this meeting. We invited people from different areas of research, from ornithology to uh, neuroscience to anthropology. It was a disaster. Basically, there was no conversation possible. People were shouting at each other. You say, aesthetic is a pure, purely human thing. Don't touch it. You, you biologists, you want to reduce everything to natural selection, sexual selection. No conversation possible. So then, but I, I'm a kind of, I'm persistent. And, um, and I kept uh, uh, like insisting. And then a few years afterwards, uh, there was another meeting uh, about what is beauty organized by philosopher. And that time, 
I found like the doors were more open. We could, we started discussing about what is real aesthetics. I found out that basically philosophers don't, don't have a consensus about what is aesthetics. Actually, they argue all the time among them. So there is nothing really that it distinguish, uh, you know, humans from animals in, in, in a concept of aesthetic. It's just like a, a matter of arbitrary definition. So, and of course, I'm not the only one uh, uh, fighting this, uh, this, uh, this, this part of this war. Uh, a few years ago, Rick, Rick Pram published this uh, uh, very interesting book about the evolution of beauty, where he has uh, a similar idea. So um, Rick doesn't actually provide any mechanism there, but he only speaks about the co-evolution, about uh, like, a, uh, like a beautiful trait and, and, and somebody who's attracted by it, this beauty. But what you are really missing now is the, are the mechanism, how this is coded by our brain. So to continue a little bit in this direction, we decided to also to expand our, our uh, range of birds. And we are now, for example, very much interested in learning. Can you learn to, be, to become attractive? Do you learn to become attractive? Not only in humans, we know that we do that because we, of course, we, we have uh, like, uh, you know, trends in how we dress and how we uh, make up and how, what cars we drive, right? And there are many, uh, many cultural aspects in, in becoming attractive. But do birds also learn how to become So this is a this was a, a display of a spotted bowerbird filmed in Queensland in Toronto National Park, which is about two hours west of Rockhampton. And you see this. I mean, probably you've seen it before. Some other videos uh, in TV or yourself, maybe. Uh, uh, but the interesting thing is that this was a display of a male to a male. So the bird sitting in the middle of the bower was not a female; it was a juvenile male who sits there to do something. And we still don't know why the juvenile males are sitting there. But one of the options, one of the possibilities that we are exploring is whether this juvenile male, male is there to learn how to display. As you've seen, the display of a spotted bowerbird is very complicated. It's, so there are many different moves. There are like many things that uh, he's doing. So maybe these juveniles spend a lot of time attending the barbers of other more expert males to learn how to proper do it. And um, so uh, actually Giovanni, uh, who was a PhD in our team, did actually most of the work with these animals, uh, uh, led it, uh, basically led this, this review that we published uh, uh, last year about the, 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 the possible potential role of learning uh, in, in, in courtship, because all we know about uh, learning in courtship is restricted to bird song. We know that juvenile songbirds learn from their tutors, from their fathers or from the tutors, how to sing. So there is evidence, at least for song, that uh, you, know, you learn how to be, become attractive, but there is nothing about postural and, choreogra and choreographies and construction activities. So the idea is basically, you know, if you to mature from like uh, uh, the, the uh, like rough and uh, uh, very simple courtship that juveniles have to a full courtship, you go through um, uh, a stage of development and this can include uh, or not include social stimuli. So you see that you have the, uh, the, simple, um, the simple motor learning, uh, on the, on the right, uh, which is basically based on practice and uh, getting like a self-feedback, understanding whether uh, you are doing something better or not, like we do when we ride a bicycle, for example. And then, and, and you have proper receptive feedback and changes in morphology. And, uh, but you can also have active social feedback uh, by, uh, uh, for example, other individuals, both males and females. So females typically give a feedback to males when they're not very good in displaying, very well-known cases in, uh, uh, in cowbirds, but also there is imitation. So maybe 
may juvenile males also learn from other adult males how to properly display. And so, we spend uh, time to analyzing practice. In this case, there is no, nobody in the Gbauer. The males spend a lot of time in practicing, in, in perfectioning their moves and trying to become better in what they do. And so this is typically something that you do when you, you have a stage of motor learning, of improving, improvement in motor performance. And so by using the, again, uh, and the, the more advanced like uh, uh, machine learning, uh, we are not now be able, to, we are now able to uh, track key points. As you can see these points on the, on the feet, on the, on the beak, on the eye, these have been placed there by the computer, we don't do anything manually any, any longer because the system is, has been trained very well, at least for spot about it. So we're able now to uh, basically to track the movement of the displaying individual on the left and also the movement of the uh, bird inside the bow. In this case, it was a female sitting there. And one of the first studies was uh, to test like uh, one hypothesis. So some colleagues from the group of uh, Gerald Borgia, who studied uh, satin bower birds for a long time, they, they found out that basically uh, one of the effects of the courtship of males is to startle the females. You've seen in previous videos that when the males do these mock attacks to the bird inside the bower, the, the bird will move out. So gets a, has a startle response, kind of scare, they move away. So we thought that uh, the role of, for example, learning could be that uh, juvenile males learn how to become more careful, not to start the females so they, 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 are, they don't go away. And uh, there were some studies uh, made with Robert uh, uh, Bowerbird by Gail Patricelli, who demonstrated actually that modulating the intensity of the courtship uh, was a way to actually reduce the, the starting response. So that is what we thought. But in fact, we found the opposite. I give you a brief explanation of this. So what you see there uh, on this graph, the, the frame numbers is basically then, you know, it's the, 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 the video recording. And you also see uh, that in this uh, kind of uh, insert, which is expanded on the right side, that you have uh, the two lines. Uh, there's a, a red line, and then there is a, like a, a vertical, uh, black bar. So the vertical black bar represents uh, basically a mock attack when the when the male is attacking, is making like a, a fake attack towards the female. And the red uh, plot it shows you the displacement. So the movement of the female inside the bow as a response. And you can see that basically the, there is very often a, like a movement after the mock attack. The female goes away. Now. In the next graph, you see the results of the analysis. Basically using uh, bootstrapping methods, we uh, calculated the predicted amount of, uh, uh, let's say, displacement of the female as a result of the mock tax. And we compared juvenile males and adult males. You see that this, the, the juvenile subordinate are in green and the adult, the owners are in red. And what you can see there is that for the subordinate, the predicted number of induced displacement, uh, which is uh, the continuous line, it's basically peak at the same point where we have the observed number of displacement, which is the dotted line. Whereas for the owner, the dotted line is very far away from the predicted one. What does it mean in simple words? It means that Adult males are very good in attacking the females and inducing the starting response without the females leaving the bower. So they are bringing the female to the highest level of excitement without pushing her away. And this is probably what juvenile have to learn in the, in the development. We still have, a, have not a demonstration for that, but this is a very different hypothesis about the role of practice and learning in bower birds. I um, want to conclude the, my presentation today 
uh, with um, uh, a couple of other things. And Thomas uh, McKeel, every sitting here in the audience, I started a couple of years ago. A PhD uh, is very much interested in, uh, in uh, rifle birds. And this is, uh, this, the, we're doing this study here in the Tablelands, so near Yangbara. And he had done some nice uh, video of the, of the bird. You probably have seen the rifle birds before. Everybody is very familiar with this uh, like, uh, movement. And this hey, you have seen it several times, I guess, also documentaries and in um, other things. But you're probably less uh, familiar with this. So this is a, these are two juvenile rifle birds that eat on a display post to learn from each other, probably. That is the hypothesis. It's like, you know, two boys playing, eat in there and, you know, do what the adults do. And, you know, we know what the, one of the, uh, uh, let's say, functions of play is to actually increase motor skills and to become more proficient in doing other things. So they pursue some motor learning, some practice, but maybe in this case, we still don't know, there is also some kind of, uh, you know, feedback, getting social feedback from other individuals. I have been uh, able, after many, many efforts, to get some funding to uh, eventually study comparative aesthetics. So I'm now collaborating with a uh, psychologist, and we are trying really to uh, find a common way to talk about attractiveness uh, in animals and humans. Uh, we mostly work uh, in the lab because we need to have a like, treatable model. So uh, ring doves are very uh, uh, domestic birds, are very easy to handle. Uh, very easy to uh, work with, and uh, and one of the interesting things is that females do self-report the quality of the male display. So females, once they've been primed by male courtship, will stay in a corner and call alone, and this induces their ovary development. And ovulation depends on how much they self-stimulate themselves. So we have a very nice way to see physiologically how good the courtship of males was by looking at self-stimulation. So we found, for example, that the, the female behavior is differentially associated with specific component of uh, courtship in doves. One of the biggest problems in studying attractiveness in animals is that most people use choice tests. So you have, for example, two males displaying we have a Y maze, the female can choose A or B. But choice and preference is not the same thing. This is something that psychologists know very well because you might actually uh, prefer A, but then you choose B for other reason because maybe B sounds less aggressive, is more familiar, whatever. How can we separate choice from preference? This is one of the aims of our project. For example, by looking not at the choice test, but looking at what females do when females are let, uh, let's say we, we expose female doves to the display of 10 different males, and then we don't ask them to choose, but we look at their behavior and we try to isolate traits of the behavior that tell us what is the preference. And we cross all the males and the females to try to also extract what we call subjective attractiveness, something that is some individuals like, but others don't, and what is objective attractiveness. Things that all females like in a male, for example. And also, we did some experiment to understand the role of multimodality. So, for example, most displays of animals are multimodal. They include uh, vocal signals, uh, visual signals, postural, postural signals. And, for example, what happens when you combine these uh, traits and these signals in a uh, in natural way, or let's say in, in a way that is not exactly the the, 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 the combination you find in nature. So, for example, where the bow synchronize with the with the movements, with the bowing movements. This is a shift. The bow toy 
come and it's a process in you know, a few milliseconds in the natural variability. So it's not in natural, but it's a little bit uh, shifted. And then we have the jittered one, where the, there's a little bit a random association between the, the sound and the movement. And yet, as you can see in the bottom graph, really only the control, only the, only the normal stimulus is really inducing a strong response in females. The other ones don't. So it is not just a single trait that is important. It has an importance, but it's the combination, what we call the config configurational value of the courtship itself, which has a strong importance in deciding whether a stimulus is attractive or not. And uh, we did also similar studies with uh, humans. This is a PhD student in our team, Chrissy. And uh, we did study with humans, for example, by altering uh, uh, voice and, uh, and, um, and, and, and faces. Surprisingly enough, psychologists uh, used to test mostly attractiveness by using black and white pictures, removing the hair, very natural stimuli. So when we started discussing about how to, we can use the same protocols to measure attractiveness in humans and animals, we told them, wow, you should use the dynamic stimuli, like videos, not just like black and white uh, pictures. Like these are very natural. And so this is what we did. And actually this was a, like a surprising uh, like a, a thing for most psychologists we work with. So we have now this uh, nice database is called Talking Faces, where we can have many recordings from actors, from many actors like, uh, and for example, we did a study where we... Hello, ich bin's. Hello, ich bin's. In this experiment, we modified the pitch. So the second, uh, the second uh, version is exactly the same video. The voice is just... Uh, modify so that the pitch is a little bit higher and is this like making the the person more attractive this is what some people think that like juvenile voices make uh, uh, people more, more attractive no the result is that the woman on the right was judged to be younger not more attractive by most people simply because like a higher pitch is strongly connected with uh, age and not but not with attractiveness so with that i think i I'm exactly at the 44th minute of my presentation. And um, I would like to thank then uh, all my co-author, collaborators, funding sources, uh, uh, field assistants, uh, and uh, all the people who helped us to uh, gather all these results I presented to you today. And thank you for your attention.